Father, we thank you today that we are not who we used to be. Because of the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, we are made new. We are forgiven of sins and we have a life without end. And Father, I pray today that we would hear your voice. We would sense the power of your presence in this place and we would leave here changed because we've encountered the living God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, uh, if there's room around you uh, because the kids vacated and uh, no one's filled that in, you might want to scoot a little closer. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but it's a little bit crowded. Do you guys notice that? You're, you're probably sitting really close to people you don't know and you're maybe feeling a little weird about that. Some of you anyway. Other people are like, hey, this is really cool. I can come to church and meet people. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of John chapter 20. If, uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, that's okay. There's some that look just like this in the pews all around you. Grab one of those. Use one of those. Uh, we're looking at page 1,153 if you want to cheat. And it uh, makes it easy that way because i got a Bible just like you if you're using one of those. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible or you need a Bible, uh, then just take one. We really want you to have the Word of God because we believe that reading it and, and learning it will change your life. And, and so uh, if you need one, grab one. And if there's not one around you because uh, someone's already taken it um, <laughs> in this service, then see one of us afterwards. We'll get you a Bible. Uh, one other thing I want you to, to discover is, as we're getting started in the, in the message is you've got this insert in your bulletin that kind of says sermon notes, life notes on it. And uh, that's really cool. It's got a, uh, some things in there for you. One of them is sermon notes, and uh, there's blanks in there. You can follow along the sermon and fill them in, and that's for one of two reasons. One is because some of you uh, are, are listening to learn, and, and so you're going to write down the things. You're going to write down stuff that God kind of impresses on your, your heart that you hear, that you go, hey, I want to remember that. That's, that's why those sermon notes are in there. The other reason those sermon notes are in there is because some of you just want to know when I'm going to be done, and so you're following going, oh, good, he's on the last point. This is awesome. Uh, so... Uh, Whatever, however they bless you, that's why they're there. So that's cool. Uh, the other part of those, uh, those notes are our life notes. And those are for our life groups. We have small groups that meet in homes throughout the year that, that study the Bible together and do fellowship together. And we want everyone to be in a life group. And uh, our next life group sign-up start till September. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of taunting you that way. But, but uh, the thing is, those life notes are for those groups to use as their discussion guide. But if you're not in a life group and you just want to learn more, uh, then use those. Let those be your personal devotion time. You can learn more about God that way. Uh, let them be your family discussion time about God. Maybe uh, you guys want to talk about the message afterwards. You've got some questions there to help you do that. And, uh, and, and that's just to bless you as well. So use that as God leads you to. Um, so I want you to discover that because life is a journey of discovery. Uh, have you noticed that? I mean, we discover things so quickly that a lot of times we take it for granted. Like, for instance, technology. I mean, computers and cell phones and, and, and tablets, aren't those the coolest things ever? And yet a lot of us grew up, in fact, I'm going to ask you to confess in just a moment. We grew up with this, this thing that, that a lot of you younger ones don't know what it, it is anymore unless you can visit a museum. It's called a rotary phone. <laughs> can, you, can, can I see your hand? Yeah, that's right. Rotary phone, people. We know the, the, the whole joy of going, and if you, you know, you're dialing long distance number and your finger slips on like the eighth number, oh, it's so frustrating because you got to start all over again and you have no idea what pain is until you're trying to use a rotary phone calling into a radio station to win something, right? Because you're like trying to speed it and won't go any faster backwards. So, and I remember as a kid watching Star Trek on TV and, and thinking, you know, there are little communicator things, Captain Kirk, talking into it and going, wouldn't that be the coolest thing if we had those? <laughs> we have those, <laughs> right? They're called cell phones. You can talk to people all over the place, wherever you are. And, and if yours flips, <laughs> you're hopelessly out of date. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not even cool for Star Trek anymore. So, you know, technology, we discover all these things and it's like so cool. And what about medical technology? Man, it, it, the, the discoveries they're making in medicine and how they're, you know, changing things, it's crazy. Uh, again, flashing back to the 70s now, I remember watching the $6 million man. I got any, got any fans here with me on that one? Yeah. You know, we can rebuild him. We can make him faster, stronger. And he had bionic legs and arm and eye, all this kind of stuff. And, and I thought, 
that's like fantasy world. What if they could do that? And here we are in 2014, and I'm going to guess that about 20% of this crowd has some kind of bionic part in them. You've got a knee, you've got a hip, you've got a shoulder, right? And, and you're living proof that that's not, now you can't grow faster and stronger, but you know, at least you're living pain-free now. So, you know, it's kind of cool the way these discoveries change our lives. Uh, but the most exciting discoveries are like the personal discoveries. And, and, uh, and I love watching babies discover stuff, right? And we are so blessed here at Calvary. We've got all these babies all over the place, and we love babies. We love, you know, hearing them and seeing them and, and just being part of the services. And, and, uh, and, and here's the cool thing. When you start watching babies grow, isn't that, isn't that fun? Because they discover their hands, and, and, and that's an amazing discovery. And then they discover their mouths. And, and then they discover they can take things with their hands and put them in their mouths that they're not supposed to. And, and then they discover their noses. And things that should go in their mouths, they put up their nose. Hmm, it's really gross is when they discover things in their nose and put them in their mouths. <laughs> Every parent in here is like, no, don't do that. You know, and, and then they keep discovering stuff and they're growing and life just gets more exciting. Uh, a few years back, we were playing uh, in a city league volleyball, and we had a team there, and, and, and some of our teammates uh, had a toddler, and, and so he comes up, and we're standing around, and for whatever reason, he, he looked at uh, my associate pastor at the time, and, and he couldn't have been more than three, and here's what he did. He just kind of like dropped his pants and went, hey, Pastor Dave, look what I got. <laughs> you got one too? All Pastor Dave said was, hey, put that thing away. It doesn't belong here. You know, discovery. You just, and, it, and then they grow up a little bit more and they discover romance. You know, because one day the opposite sex has cooties and the next day they're wonderful. And you know that day has, has happened when, especially with boys, right, when they discover personal hygiene. When they wake up one day and they're like, they, they suddenly are aware that they have body odor. Now, let's face it. They've had body odor for 10 years. And you've been like trying to get them to take a bath, trying to get them to take a shower all the time. And you like have to fight to get them to get in there once a week just to wash the grossness off. And now suddenly, you know, they've discovered romance because you can't get them out of the bathroom. You know, they're in there showering eight times a day and you're spending more money on, you know, uh, body spray and hair product than you did on your first car. And... and See, discoveries are exciting, but discoveries can also be unsettling, right? Like when you discover your first gray hairs. Still dreading that day. Uh, or, or when you discover that nice police officer wants to have a personal conversation with you, and they let you know with those pretty lights shining behind you. Just unsettling, you know? And then discoveries can be terrible. You know, when you discover that your child's an addict, when you discover that you've got cancer, when you discover a loved one has died, it, it breaks your life and breaks your heart, and it's a terrible discovery. So discoveries can be terrible, they can be unsettling, they can be exciting. And I want you to know that the first Easter was a journey of discovery for a lady named Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of John, 20th chapter. We're going to kind of walk through her discovery uh, on that resurrection morning. Uh, Mary's life had been changed by Jesus. Her life was completely messed up, and Jesus healed her and delivered her, and she became one of his followers, and she was devoted to him and dedicated to him, and she was the first one who saw Jesus alive. And, and, and so we're going to just kind of walk through her discovery on Easter. It starts off with the fact that she discovered the stone was moved. John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, said, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, this was unsettling to her, uh, but the whole week had been one tragic discovery after another. Remember, this is just seven days earlier. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, and the crowds were shouting Hosanna, and people were dreaming of making him Messiah. He was going to be the king. And, and during that week, she had discovered that Judas had betrayed Jesus. And she discovered that Jesus had been arrested and condemned. 
And then she discovered that Jesus was crucified and he died and he was buried. And so her whole week had been just completely ruined with these terrible, tragic discoveries. And so she goes to the tomb grieving and mourning and, and wanting to, to mourn the loss of her master only to discover that the stone has moved and Jesus' body is gone. So Mary assumes that the body is stolen and she runs and tells Peter and John uh, all about it and they come and look and see uh, that it's like she said and, and then they go back to their houses But Mary is still thinking about body snatchers and grave robbers. And then Mary discovers the reality of angels. Uh, Pick up the story in verse 11. It says, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. I don't know where they've laid him. Now, it is amazing to me that Mary reacts to the angels like she does. I don't know if that catches anybody else by surprise, but but she's standing there. Remember, she's been to the tomb. She's looked in there. Jesus' body isn't there. She goes and gets Peter and John. They look in the tomb. Body isn't there. She's there. She's weeping. She looks into the tomb, and poof, there's these two angels sitting there dressed in white. I don't know about you. Maybe you guys run into angels all the time. I have never personally encountered angels like in glowing white robes, but if I did, I would freak out. Okay? I would not just be like talking casually with them. You know, I might freak out good. I might freak out, but I don't know, but I just would not. It would kind of make an impression on me. I mean, because she's standing at the tomb. She didn't see them fly in or anything. They just appeared in there. And so she's in the presence of a miracle of God, and she's weeping, and, and, and they say, hey, woman, why are you crying? And she's like, well, I can't find Jesus' body. And, and she's missing the message of hope that the angels represent because she is so lost in her pain and her grief and her sorrow. Has that ever happened to you? Do you ever get so wrapped up in your pain And in your grief and in your failure and in your loss that you miss out on the message of hope that God's trying to send you? See, because here's what I think. I think every day God is communicating his love to you, his grace to you, his hope to you, his presence to you. He wants you to know that he loves you. He wants you to know that he's with you. He wants you to know that he cares about you. And I think he sends messages to us all the time. Okay, again, I told you, I haven't run into angels, but, uh, you know, the beauty of the world around us, the voices of friends and family, the the people that speak into our lives, God really is trying to communicate that message of hope, and so often we just miss it. It, it, It's kind of like spring, you know? It's spring outside, and, and spring is a season of renewal. It's life again. God's reminding us that there is new life in Him because the death of winter becomes the you know, the beauty of spring as things bloom and flowers and trees and all that kind of stuff. And what do we usually say about that? We complain about our allergies, right? I, I know I do. And we moan about the fact that God planted wildflowers in our yards. Because we call them weeds, not flowers, right? And we, you know, get out there and pull them or pay someone to pull them or go out there and try to burn them up and kill them. That's right, God, you send me a message of hope, and I'm going to fry it right here. (laughs) See, that's what we do. God is trying to remind us that he's there. And like Mary, we're blinded by our tears or our pain, and we don't get it. We just don't get it. So Mary discovers the reality of angels, and then she discovers the living Jesus. Story continues, and it gets uh, stranger still. So verse 14, having said this, She turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She discovered the living Jesus. Now, does it 
shock anybody else in here that Mary is looking for Jesus. She's focused on Jesus and she's talking to Jesus and she doesn't recognize Jesus. I mean, that just blows my mind. Every time I read this, I'm going, seriously? Do you think that you could be looking for someone and, and, and distraught that you can't find them and be talking to them and not realize it? And yet that's exactly what happened to her. How in the world did she miss Jesus when she's having a conversation with Jesus? The only answer I can come up with is that Jesus wasn't what she expected. He wasn't what she expected. I mean, she was looking for a corpse, wasn't she? She was looking for a dead guy and wrapped up in these cloths and, and, and she can't find the body, so she assumes it's stolen. And hey, sir, tell me where you've laid him. And finally, Jesus says, Mary? And she realizes and discovers the living Jesus and everything in her life changes at that point. I think a lot of us miss Jesus when he's right in front of us because he's not what we expect. He's just really not what we expect. We're not really sure what we're looking for, but he surprises us and we miss him. So today, I just got to ask you, have you discovered the living Jesus as your Savior? Because he's here today, and he suffered and died for you, and he rose from the dead, and he's calling your name. I really believe that he's here, and he's calling your name, and he's inviting you to discover him and let him change your life. So have you found him? Because when we follow Jesus, we discover all right, I know it's rude, but I'm going to stop in the mid-sentence right there. When we follow Jesus, we discover. Um, before I talk about what we discover when we follow Jesus, let me talk about following Jesus for a second. Because that's how we define uh, a relationship with God here at Calvary. We talk about having a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ and following Jesus. In fact, we hardly ever ask somebody if they're a Christian. Because we don't do labels a lot here at Calvary. In fact, I don't think God's really into labels. And, and I don't know if you realize this, but a lot of times we use labels to kind of dismiss people or kind of stop listening to people. Because if I put a label on you and, and, and I don't like that label, then I can just like judge you and kind of say, I can ignore you now. Or if I put a label on you that says you agree with me on everything, then I can stop listening to you because we don't agree on everything. I don't think you can find anybody in this world you agree on everything with, right? And, and so we use these labels all over the place. And, and the problem with labels is is that they don't necessarily communicate what's real on the inside. Labels can lie to you, right? Because there's fakes out there. I know this because I've shopped in Beijing, China, and I bought a coach purse for 10 bucks. <laughs> How many of you, if I told you I paid $10 for a coach purse, would believe it's really a coach purse? <laughs> it's got a coach label on it, you know? But just because it has a coach label on it, and if you look at it from a distance, it looks like a coach purse, right? But if you get it up close to it, it's not really a coach purse. It's just a fake with a label on there. And too many times in the church, people put labels on, and that not, is not necessarily really true on what's on the inside. And so we don't use labels here at Calvary. What we want to see is actions. We, we want to see actions. So we want to know if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, not just wearing a label of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about a follower of Jesus Christ, what we mean is that as a follower of Jesus, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And that you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins personally. And that he was raised from the dead. And you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Kind of like you saw these ladies do earlier in the service in baptism. Because they declared to the world, I'm an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ and he's changed my life and I want to dedicate my life to following him. doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. It just means they've set their direction for life to follow Jesus. So I hope and pray today that you're a follower of Jesus Christ because when we follow Jesus, we discover a new life. We discover a new life. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Uh, see, following Jesus changes our lives like nothing else. And, and in fact, uh, the only thing that I, I can even imagine coming close to that experience of, of life change that Jesus brings into your life is, is parenthood. 
How many of you are parents in this room? Okay, lots of hands go up. This, this illustration should work then. How many of you that are parents can remember back to what it was like before children? <laughs> See, before children. Remember when you were before children and you knew everything? <laughs> right? Because you looked at your friends with kids and you went, hey, when I'm a parent, I'm not going to. When I have children, my kids aren't going to. Yeah, we said stuff like that, right? And we looked at that whole parenting to-do list and we went, yes, I can do that. Nurturing, got that. Feeding, got that. Tear, you know, I can do that. And we, talk, we thought we could do all that kind of stuff, right? And then we wanted kids and then God gave us kids and we're like, wow, this is different. <laughs> and everything changes when you have children. No longer can you just leave the house when you want to, right? Life is all about them suddenly. And, and you, you never knew the joys of sleepless nights and projectile vomiting. And it was so cool last night, 6 o'clock, right after I talked about that, somebody went outside and had a kid throw up on them. It was great. They came over to show me, you know. The sermon illustration was real. It wasn't their kid either. <laughs> That's what the beautiful part was. See? So be careful when you say, hey, can I hold your baby? Uh, so... You know, and as parents, you just go, eh, badge of honor, it's all cool, right? See, it's because it's so different. You learn all this stuff, and you never knew the joy of what it would be to hear someone call you mom or dad. You never knew you could love somebody like that. And see, that's how it is when you follow Jesus, when you invite Jesus to change your life. I mean, you can look in from the outside and go, okay, so you people are kind of like more religious, and you go to church more, and... You do that Bible stuff, and, and, and you serve. Okay, I, I see all that stuff. You see the to-do list, but until you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't know how he's going to change your life. And that's why we invite you to experience this. Become a follower of Jesus and allow him to change your life. Because Jesus offers you a new life beyond your imagination. So when we follow Jesus, we discover a new life. We also discover complete forgiveness. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In other words, God will completely forgive you. And I know a lot of people mistakenly believe that God is angry and vindictive and condemning. But Jesus said the Father sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. And so it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or where you've been or what your baggage is from the past, God offers you complete forgiveness and all you have to do is ask. And, and I know a lot of churches, they kind of freak out at that point because they want to say, well, you got to ask and you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. But the truth is God just says you got to ask. Because when he enters into your life and forgives you of your sins, he changes you and gives you a new life. And, and so he knows that you're going to live in that wonder of, Freedom of forgiveness, laying down your guilt and your shame and not having to live in that anymore, it changes us. So we follow Jesus, we discover a new life, we discover complete forgiveness. We also discover life-changing truth. Jesus said, if you hold on to my teachings, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. See, God has given us a wonderful gift called the Bible. And in it is his directions for how to live a blessed life. How to live a life that's going to be filled with joy and love and peace and, you know, all, all the stuff the Bible talks about. And, and so God has given us this as our guidebook for how to live. And so if we follow God's directions, he will set us free. But you know why our lives have so many bumps and bruises and crashes and dead ends? It's because we're not following God's directions. In a sense, we live our lives like men drive. Yeah, we refuse to stop and ask directions. In case you're wondering where that was going. And, and, uh, and, and I know GPS has kind of changed all that because now you can get wrong directions from your phone or from your car. But uh, the, uh, uh, and by the way, I, I firmly believe that uh, GPS was, you know, discovered and invented by frustrated wives who knew that their husbands were never going to stop and ask directions. <laughs> so it kind of changes things. Um, by the way, do you know 
why men don't stop and ask directions? Oh, I hear, you know, every service, there's some, it's pride. It's not pride, women, that we don't stop and ask directions. It's because, guys, are you with me on this? It's because when we stop and ask directions, some idiot gives us the wrong directions. <laughs> every time I stop and have asked directions, I'm more confused when I walk away from that person than I was. I was like, I can get lost on my own. I don't need your help. And, and honestly, I've heard people give directions, you know, like in the convenience stores and stuff, and somebody comes in and asks, and, and you listen to them describe directions, and you're going, oh, this is bad. <laughs> Follow them out to their car and go, hey, ignore everything they just told you. Here's how to get there. And, and, and see, here's our lives. There are a lot of voices giving direction in our lives. A lot of voices that are telling us which way to go and how to live, and you got to decide who you're going to listen to. There's only one set of directions that'll set you free. And that's God's set. Jesus offers you the truth that will change your life and bless your life. So Easter is the story of discovery. And your life is a journey of discovery. I pray today that you have discovered the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Because he is not dead, he is risen. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you love us, that you have redeemed us through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And Lord, I pray that every person in this room would know you and would know your love and would know your grace and mercy that you have given. God, we want to celebrate the freedom that you offer us in Jesus Christ. And so teach us, touch us, change our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.